The place didn't seem a village so much as a straggling collection of homesteads. The huts grew out of the earth, walls of mud, roofs of thatch, and blended continuously into it in a way that made it impossible to keep hold of what was where. They were grouped around clearings edged by trees and a patchwork of small fields leading by little paths through the grass to more walls of mud, roofs, thatch, another clearing surrounded by an almost identical patchwork of fields. By some collective process I didn't follow, it was agreed that a woman called Kiru was the appropriate person to be responsible for me, and I was led off to her hut. The faces around me merged into a blur of curious humanity, eyes following whatever I did, talking and laughing at things I didn't understand. The crash course in the language was wiped clean out of my head. I learned names and forgot them again. For each time I looked, there seemed to be more people, or different people, or in confusingly different combinations. I attached myself to Kidulele, like a mute daughter-in-law. She was the mother of several almost grown-up children, and some already married. I never managed to work out the details. There was no sign of a husband. But she had much more status than a widow, so presumably he was a person of significance, currently away. Kidulele talked at me as she instructed, till I began to latch on to a handful of phrases. Each time I got hold of a new one, I felt a surge of competence, only to be dumped a few minutes later back into silence, watching, while others moved the action on. It was exhausting being so fundamentally de-skilled losing all capacity to initiate or decide. I felt stripped of layers of instinctive self-protection, my own kind of knowledge, my accustomed way of being, leaving me naked, vulnerable. My rucksack turned out to be a more useful asset than anything I had studied about kinship systems. The women gathered, waiting for me to unpack it, each item of clothing was examined with intense interest, the expressions on their faces indicating puzzlement, envy, ribald amusement. The boys pointed to my watch and mind that they'd like to try it on. It instantly became a focus of intense negotiation, like a war trophy. I caught sight of it in the days that followed, each time on the wrist of another youth. I assumed it was coming back to me eventually, but I lost any sense of why one needed it. I'd have happily left it, but it was clear it would cause serious problems if it stayed. When you don't have words, the rhythm of every day does your communicating for you. It was obvious when we were to sleep, to rise, to prepare food, to eat. I walked with the young girls to the stream where they fetched water and was a source of high entertainment because I failed to carry even the smallest bucket on my head without spilling it. I squatted to watch an old woman who sat with her legs splayed, surrounded by neat piles of grass that she was weaving into a mat. Suddenly she began to talk to me, a long story. She couldn't grasp that I didn't understand, or possibly she didn't mind. After a while, she pushed the bit of mat she was working on towards me and gestured for me to have a go. The world beyond had lost reality. Afterwards, in the blur of impressions, I would remember if ever I sat on the ground sitting just so each evening with Kilulele on the mat she spread on the stamped earth outside her hut, while the sound of the women's quiet talking washed over me and the dark released me from the need to try and communicate. The night sounds, the crickets relentless, and beneath them the throb of drumming from some other village. I look at my watch, and I remember the day I was leaving, a child was sent to find the boy who was currently wearing it. Time being given back to me. In this place, where there was more of it than anyone would think of counting. No house to live in unless you build it. No food to eat unless you grow it. No water to wash or cook with unless you fetch it. Yet no one hurries. No one 
legs, how long a task will take. Time is there, an underlying measure of the seasons. People move within it. Times for hoeing, for planting, weeding and harvesting, threshing, storing, and all connected to a more fundamental pulse, the slowly changing stages of life, birth, childhood, puberty, marriage, then starting all over again with childbirth. Yet, these same people, in their music, instinctively divide time so fast, so energetically, that it takes years for precise time in the city dwellers like me to learn to really hear it. 